Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our version tonight of the virtual night sky. This is presented by Arizona State University School of Earth and Space Exploration. My name is Rick Alling, and I am part of a community outreach group. We take our community outreach very seriously at the school. And uh, during COVID and because of the pandemic, we're just not having the traditional visitors that we usually have. And so it's a little sad. I go into campus every once in a while, and we're used to having a place buzzing with students, our own students, college age students, but also um, uh, K-12 visitors and uh, families and visitors of all ages. So it's um, when we get back uh, to work and when we are able to reopen our building, we're hoping uh, everybody will come visit us again. Uh, the idea behind these virtual night skies is just to kind of keep some contact. We want to make sure that you know we're still here we're doing our thing we're keeping our our, uh, our ourselves busy and, and we've, we've moved to a, a virtual format in a lot of different ways so you will see science lectures and other programming next year we will continue this virtual night sky this every other wednesday we're going to take a break a little bit uh for the rest of december and the first part of january and then we will be uh, be back uh, in, on january 13th i'll remind everybody at the end of the program as well um, the other thing that we do is we like to have uh, young people to participate not only in this particular program we like to think this is a family thing to do that you can all sit around uh, uh, the, the your living room uh, uh, viewing station and and watch the program because we also give you things to do outside uh, the idea is to learn about things here and then go out and look in the night sky to see if you could find what we're talking about and so we'll have some of that for you today too I hope since last uh, episode, uh, we talked about the Geminid meteor shower, and I hope some of you were able to get out there. It's cold. Uh, I've been out about twice. I saw uh, one or two meteors. One of my colleagues said that they've been out uh, nightly and they've seen more. So I know they're out there and I know it's it, it did peak several days ago, uh, but there's still a chance if you haven't. And so just for tonight, if you don't mind, if you have taken advantage of that, if you have actually gone out and seen a Geminid, we kind of want to know. So can you use the question and answer thing and just say, yep, I saw it, uh, whatever it was last week, when you did it, what you saw, how late it was, and how you kept from freezing to death when you were out there. So so if you wouldn't mind, just so we'd like to know if anybody's doing that. Um, um, we have a, an exciting program today. The hour is packed. We've got four sections. In a moment, I'm going to introduce a guest, uh, Dr. Nancy C. Maryboy. We're going to talk about native skies. After that, we're going to give everybody an update on the Hayabusa 2 mission, which was a sample return from an asteroid actually run by the Japanese Space Agency. We're going to talk about the winter solstice and why it is what it is and, uh, and the meaning of the winter solstice and why it's important and what to look for, what it does for us. Um, and then we're also going to talk, uh, get everybody prepared for the greatest show of December, which is the Great Conjunction. So uh, you might already know that in five days on Monday night, uh, the uh, the uh, solstice night on the 21st, completely coincidental, uh, uh, there's going to be a conjunction. We'll get you up to speed on that, where things are right now, what to look for over the next couple of days. And then we're going to do a special broadcast earlier, about 5.30 on Monday night, and we'll be using telescopes. We're going to try to get live views of the of the planets and what they're doing. So that's part of tonight too. So with the, taking a deep breath, um, I'm going to get started. And so uh, I'm just really, really pleased to have uh, Dr. Mary Boy with us. I came, became to know her because I've known her uh, efforts in uh, native cosmologies. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and talking about Native education and uh, uh, about those things. She is actually a colleague of a colleague of ours, uh, one of our professors at ASU, and they worked together, Steve Simpkin, they worked together many years ago. I was kind of first enamored by uh, Dr. Mary Boy and her colleague, Dr. Begay, uh, with a book. I'm going to actually share it for you to just have the screen. Let me just get that up and that will kind of start, uh, launch that. <clears throat> And uh, so uh, uh, earlier in our programming, uh, somebody asked and they said, can we do some programming that uh, has to do with uh, native skies, with night skies, with uh, uh, the astronomy of uh, Native Americans? And uh, we said, certainly, but uh, it, traditionally you don't do that at certain times of year and you do do that at certain times of year. So uh, winter time is the time to, to tell stories and do those kinds of things. So we're, we're organizing to do that now. And I 
I asked uh, Dr. Mary Boy if she would join us, and she said yes. So um, I'm going to introduce her. Sharing the Skies is the book that I fell in love with. Uh, it's about Navajo astronomy, and you see there it's by Nancy Mary Boy and, uh, and Dr. David Begay. Nancy is here to visit with us tonight. Welcome on board. Thank you. Nancy, would you mind, can we uh, start, can you just kind of um, uh, kind of talk a little bit about the book and what inspired you to, uh, uh, to, uh, to write this book and make it available? Myself. There you go. Okay, can you see me? We can, can yes. Me? Yes, we can see you. Mm -hmm. There you go. We're both pinned now. That's good. Okay. So it's perfect. Okay. Well, I want to say um, thank you for having me, Rick. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about native astronomy. It's one of the great passions of my life. And it's really nice to know that so many of you are out there turning, tuning into this show. So um, Rick is going to ask me some questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Yeah, so let's let's start with the book. What inspired you to sort of you know why that book and uh, and uh, I know so um, uh, we don't have time to sort of like show images and things like that. But what I know that you and David did is they sort of identified some really modern things. There's some astrophysics and some real uh, current research uh, going on, and that's juxtaposed to some of the Greek traditional sort of constellation things, and that's juxtaposed to uh, native culture and some of the and we'll see some of those constellations in a moment, but. But where did the idea come from? And I hope it's a success. I looked online. It's still on Amazon, so people can go get Sharing the Skies and uh, learn for themselves about that. So, so what started the idea? Well, it's, on, it's about its fifth or sixth printing now. Um, okay, we excellent. have been very interested in studying our own skies. Um, I'm Navajo and Cherokee, and Paul uh, Rose and David's Navajo and Pueblo. And we... Um, we wanted the, the main reason behind us doing all this research, which has been at least 30 years by now, um, we wanted to be able to uh, pass it down to younger Navajos, youth, that they had a very vibrant and exciting astronomy. That, they were our number one um, audience for this because most Navajo, 99%, don't know they had this exciting astronomy. It's in the realm of esoteric and specialized knowledge and it's it's sacred and it's only talked about certain times of the year. So everything we did, we got permission from the um, different Navajo Nation uh, medicine men societies, um, what we were able to let out of, of the Navajo Nation. So we had years of, of of um, I guess going out, looking at the sky, everything in Navajo happens that's exciting around dawn. So that meant a lot of very early morning um, visit, <laughs> uh, just what was going on. A lot of the research was done at Diné College where I was a student and then a faculty and then an administrator. And so and I did it all in partnership with David B. Gay. So we, um, that's why we wanted to write a book so people could take it home and look at it and learn what the Navajo side unfiltered through a Western filter, unfiltered through Western perceptions and um, different books that had been written. There hadn't been anything done that was actually the perspective of the indigenous people. So that was where we came in. And then we were, we've contracted with NASA for many years now. We still are contract with NASA. And so they, we had access to all these Hubble photographs and a lot of different astronomers um, from different um, various NASA um, missions and other friends. And so uh, we wanted to show the Western and the native, um, it's like two eyed seeing. If yeah. you have two eyes looking up at the sky and two perspectives, it gives you a wider picture than if you just know the Western uh, perspective or the native perspective. That's excellent. Let me ask you, is is it work and the idea of bringing up a new generation of Navajo? And do you have some interest? Is this happening? Is there uh, is there younger people that are coming into uh, into the field, as it were, and, and there learning? Are some, there are some. And okay. we've taught a course that uh, an in introduction to indigenous astronomy for a Northern Arizona university for oh. about okay. years. And we just stopped teaching it so we could concentrate on some of these other things we're doing. We're developing a new planetarium show. We developed um, 
a couple, some years back, we developed a show called Sharing the Skies, um, which um, you can show in a full dome planetarium or on a flat screen in a classroom. Yep. And so um, we're, we do, we give uh, presentations to school districts, um, communities, um, and individual schools. So we're always out there um, just spreading the word. Good. I'm going to, I'm going to share with people the web page and I'm going to move on sort of off the book a little bit, but what you're doing now, where I sort of know you from today is uh, uh, the Institute. So uh, Indigenous Education Institute. Can you talk a little bit about that and what it's about and its breadth and what you're doing? And I'll bring up an image so people can kind of connect it to a website here as we go. I would love to. About 25 years ago, David and I started a nonprofit 501c3 called the Indigenous Education Institute, and we're uh, we're still going strong. And so um, it's um, that's our website, what you're looking at now. And our mission has to do with preserving and protecting and applying to issues today traditional Navajo knowledge because it's 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 so. It's so holistic. It's so diverse. It's it holds answers to so many of the pressing questions and situations we're going through today. That's excellent. And you're based. You yourself now are based in the Northwest. Is that right? And so, so and my did, family from uh, near Bluff, Utah, by rocks. Except like I did something in the, um, the Northwest on San Juan Island, where the okay. skies are not nearly as big <laughs> and, I'll, I'll not. and visible. And I will not be able to see the season tonight. No gemlins, no yeah. nothing. <laughs> it's raining. Yeah, well, that's what we think of the Northwest, so that's, that's all right. Well, we hope you have a chance, actually, now that COVID, I guess people aren't traveling. Okay, I think but... you're muted. Oh, am, uh, no, I'm, I think I'm fine. I think I'm okay. Um, yeah, I know we, still here, yeah, we were having some trouble with your uh, feed, Nancy. So maybe, uh, maybe we'll do this. I'm going to uh, 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 kind of just move to the next part we were going to talk about. What I did uh, for everybody is I extracted uh, three images out of the book itself, Sharing the Skies. Um, and oops, she had to drop off, I think, and she'll come back. Let me sort of see. I'll, I'll do that. And um, I wanted to uh, uh, kind of just have her kind of walk us through these are this is sort of falls into that category of things that you can go out tonight and look for. And so I'm going to show you the images. And then when Nancy comes back, she will be able to kind of walk us through uh, what they mean uh, to Navajo culture. And you will recognize some of the constellations and asterisms that are in the images themselves. Uh, while I'm waiting for her to come back online, uh, one of the other things I was going to announce this at the end of the show, but I'll use it now. Uh, uh, Rick. So she's, like back. she's back. Okay. So uh, uh, Nancy, I'm going to just kind of like switch over to those images. Remember, we kind of talked about this a little bit. So uh, first, uh, uh, this is one of the reasons I loved the book and uh, is because uh, the uh, illustrations were amazing. So this is uh, um, Melvin, uh, oh, sh I'm sorry, I forgot his last name. Maybe you could introduce the artist and um, Bainbridge, I'm sorry, Melvin Bainbridge. And uh, and then if you, uh, I think we have the connection back now, if you can just kind of walk us through sort of what these particular images mean and who these characters are, and how to find them in the night sky. Yes, well, this one um, would be very easy for you to find tonight if you have a clear sky. This is the Big Dipper. In Navajo, these three are considered one constellation. So in the middle, you see the central fire of the sky, which is Polaris. And you'll see on the left-hand side, the Big Dipper. And on the right-hand side, you'll see the tail of the Little Dipper going up and becoming the Little Dipper. This is called um, this is called the central fire of the sky, as I said, and it's called Nahuacospecon um, in Navajo. On the left-hand side is the Big Dipper, but say, but say it's, um, excuse me, um, and he is a warrior. Sometimes they call him um, revolving male, uh, and on the right is the a revolving female, Nahuacospead, um, Nahuacospeca. And um, so the male warrior is, is like a father. He, he watches over his family. He's got his weapons um, with him, his bow guard. And he's um, always stays around the central fire and protects his family. 
on the right hand side is Cassiopeia, the female dipper who always stays home too. And she has her weapons as well. And you'll see her with grinding stone, grinding sticks. Um, she, she protects her family through feeding them and, and um, nurturing them. Now, if you go outside tonight, you'll see just, just exactly how it looks um, in that middle picture. You'll see the, the Big Dipper with its handle pointing up and you'll see Cassiopeia, which looks something like a W up, up, uh, on the other side of the Big Dipper. And so the Cassiopeia is gonna be closer to the middle of the sky and the Big Dipper will be closer to the northern horizon, at least it, that's how it is up here. Yeah. And, uh, and so the way to find it is go and find Polaris, the North Star, and then look up and then look over and you'll see all three of the constellations. It's, a, it's appropriate to use this particular image and this particular thing because uh, those of you who have been with us for this whole 14 episodes, right, we started last May and we started with the Big Dipper and we'd started with sort of how to find Polaris and how it rotates around the sky. And then uh, three weeks ago, we were telling a really, really big major story about Cassiopeia and her place in the sky. And so here's just two totally different ways to look at it. And I'll tell you, for, for me, uh, next time I look, next time I go find Cassiopeia, which would be really easy to find tonight. Um, uh, I'm going to kind of think of this. Can you pronounce those names just one more time to sort of see if I can, I don't know if I can catch it or not. So try that. Um, well, the, the middle one, Nahon um, Conspecon is the central fire. Okay. Nahon Conspecon is the male dipper and Nahon Conspecon is the female dipper. Excellent. Nahon Conspecon means um, and north so oh, it does. okay yeah. so so the and then you also said and then we'll sort of like just kind of come to a close here but you said that, that all three of these constellations are sort of thought of as, as really one right this is this is one story across the sky and it interacts these characters interact with each other and all of that stuff as opposed to distinct uh, individual constellations is that well, right? I'll, I'll add one more thing a lot of these constellations were placed in the sky for a reason and one of the main reasons is to show show people here on earth um, a proper way to behave and to live the natural cosmic order. And so that's why they carry these lessons. I think that's absolutely excellent. So um, I was just going to say, when you had to drop off for a little bit, um, uh, Nancy and I have been talking about uh, actually re-engaging in February. So we, we haven't locked down a date yet. There's some logistics. We have to try it. But here, here's the proposal. is for one of our virtual night sky programs in the winter still, so late January or early February. We'd like to have uh, uh, both Nancy and David back, and we'd like to actually dedicate the whole program as much as possible uh, to this particular topic. Um, and we'd like to, if we can, preview uh, the planetarium show that you put together and then have a, a question and answer. Uh, we've kind of got most of the logistics worked out. It's just really locking in that date and finding it. So, so unfortunately, uh, the timing tonight is we're just going to give you a little sort of taste and a little bit of a tidbit of, uh, of what's possible, what we're trying to accomplish here. We're sort of like introducing some of these subject ideas. But uh, uh, Let's look forward to February. Let's sort of just do this in a in a bigger way, and let's uh, have you back. And uh, I think that would be absolutely amazing. And uh, so, uh, so thank you, uh, Nancy, for coming. Thank you very much for sharing at least the the brief time we've had together with us. I hope uh, everything works out for you. Uh, would you just once again, though, I'll give you a, a moment to, if you if you would, just kind of uh, introduce some of the things. I think you said also. There's a special program you were talking about on January the 29th um, uh, that uh, maybe we can get people prepared for. They can look forward to that. So, Yes, we're going to be, um, this is a NASA program we're giving one of the sessions for, and it's going to be on Navajo astronomy. Uh, we'll have some student, students in classes, one in Durango and one on the reservation. You'll see um, different facts and interesting things you can um, actually construct in your own house to show the Nahokos um, pattern. And this is going to be January 29th. We don't have the time locked down now, so we'll depend on Rick to get back to you sometime in January and yep. tell you the link and, and the time. 
we certainly will. And so I want people to, uh, to know that they're, you know, we're, we're kind of sharing things. I, I also had a chance, uh, Nancy, to share uh, some of the Polynesian navigation stuff because I was able to participate in your uh, lecture about that last October. And so, uh, and so the, great. this particular subject is way bigger than us, way bigger than ASU. And uh, it's fascinating. And uh, when we can find opportunities for our audience to kind no, of go, get out and do that kind of stuff. <laughs> oh, I think maybe you are too, uh, again. Uh, so uh, anyway, so uh, I'm going to uh, kind of just uh, come to a close. We, uh, we do have to, we're kind of trying to stay with our timing here. Uh, Nancy, we're going to just a little question segment. And uh, what happens is the students in the background have kind of been, been uh, watching the questions come in as people are asking them. The audience, I didn't say this at the beginning, but if you have any questions as we go through, uh, there are students that are answering them live if they can and they want to and they do it that way, or they will bring some questions to these little breaks. And so uh, Nancy, thank you very much for coming. You're certainly welcome to hang for the rest of the program. We've got lots going on tonight, and and uh, and uh, and if not, we'll we'll uh, say good night and thank you again very much. And we'll definitely see you in the um, after the first of the year and uh, in the first part of the of next year. That'll be great. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, everybody, I'm going to turn it over to uh, the student crew that is um, kind of managing some questions. We also have some polling for you. Uh, it's kind of one of our processes. And I'll take a moment just now to uh, have somebody tell me if they have anything that uh, we should catch Nancy about before she leaves. Let me know. And then otherwise, we'll, we'll move on with it. I'm going to stop share if I can. <clears throat> Um, I don't think we have any questions uh, necessarily. Okay, um, we have a lot of compliments, um, a lot of very um, good presentations. A lot of people were very happy to hear. Let me just interrupt you a little bit, Alex. Sorry about that. We just got a question. Um, it could be related to what Nancy just uh, presented. Um, the question is, do neighboring Indian nations or tribes have similar constellation stories? Yes, they do, but they're all different. Um, like Lakota will be all different from the one um, that we're presenting on Navajo. The one I talked about January 29th will be on Mayan astronomy, if um, which should be really interesting. And then we've had Lakota and Dakota. The name of this session is, these sessions are called Two-Eyed Seeing, and they are coming out of NASA. Um, but yes, um, a lot of the tribes have lost their astronomical knowledge and some it's still very strong, but it's sacred. It's not something you go in and ask a tribal member about very often because they may not be allowed to tell you or they may not want to tell you or they might love to share with you. It just depends. But uh, it's such a fascinating subject all around the world. Uh, we've spent a lifetime now connecting with different indigenous astronomers and learning about how they see the skies. And all of us are happy to share a great bit, bunch of this with all of you. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. All right, team, uh, I think you have a poll question to like throw up uh, for us and um, and uh, then we'll kind of continue with, with other questions if you have them. All right, thank you, Rick. Um, so here's the first poll question. So how many virtual night sky shows have you attended? This is my first one, two to five, five plus and all 14. And to those who say all 14, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> you can wait for just another moment. I see a little thing on my screen that says, uh, oh, I guess I see it. Okay, that's it. I see. I guess we can end the polls now. Now I'm going to quickly share the results for you, Rick. There you go. Look at look at all those five plusers. Thank you guys very much. So uh, so I appreciate you making this part of the uh, part of your regular activity. The uh, um, the idea, of course, started um, because uh, of the of the virus, uh, and we thought, well, this is the perfect way to actually do something together and be apart at the same time. Um, and I think just sort of some of these leads we have followed, and some of the talk about cultural astronomy right now, and the use of astronomy to use as a 
as a teaching tool and all of that stuff. It just, it makes it universal and it makes it, uh, it the opportunity for us to, uh, uh, to present these and kind of keep us as a community in a format where we have to stay apart, I think is really one of the things we wanted to do. And I think it's been a success. Thank you. I think we have some more, Sperti. Is there another poll or, we just, or do you guys have any questions you want to answer live? Yep, sure. Uh, we can go ahead uh, for the second poll. Alicia, mm -hmm. you want to take over? Sure. The, we'll launch the second poll. Alrighty. So did you, uh, anybody in the audience happen to catch the Geminid meteor shower? Go ahead and answer the poll, yes or no. Oh, look, some people are trying it. Good. Yeah. Awesome. It as a, looks like a decent amount went out. And, and as a as a planetarium guy, I, I I stopped a long time ago sending people out in the middle of the night to look for meteors because it's often so disappointing. <laughs> but uh, but the Geminids is one of the brighter ones. It's uh, because it's winter time, it, the sky is clear, and because uh, in this particular case, this particular version of the Geminids had a fairly new moon, or a, the moon wasn't as obstructive as it can be. So uh, so oh good good for you guys. That's really super cool. I love that part. I'll go ahead and end the poll. And it looks like about a quarter of us did. So awesome. Way to go outside. <laughs> I should just imagine all these people with colds and you know, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, I've a lot of people were saying that they were able to see about ten within an hour. So there were a oh, lot. Oh, that's of, oh, this is a good yeah. one then. This is yeah. A, so it was in North Phoenix even. So um, okay, a lot of people seeing them when they did. So that's good. Excellent. Well, so, Many yeah, people so, say they saw a big blue one. Uh, oh. So I, apparently there was a big one. Hey, can great. we? Can we tie that down to a particular night? Did they say which night they saw it, or is it? Uh, um, they said. I think the, most of them said Sunday night. Sunday mm -hmm. night. Okay. So, so this, so I was wondering if that might happen is that uh, a couple of people sort of start reporting the same meteor, right? So the, 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 because they're out at the same time, obviously mm -hmm. another universality we can all sort of share and, and see that's really super cool. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, I am getting ready for part three, but part two, are we ready to do that, guys? Are you all yeah. right? Is this it? Yeah, okay, we're set so, to go. So, so what happened is, um, I, I don't know if anybody caught this or not. It didn't uh, capture sort of the US media as much as other places, but there was a pretty significant uh, uh, achievement uh, in technology and exploration that happened recently. And so it's a Japanese mission uh, to collect a sample from an asteroid. And uh, Alex uh, and Alicia have put together sections of a little presentation just to get everybody up to speed on what happened, uh, why am I all excited about this, and uh, uh, and sort of uh, kind of what to watch for in the in the next part. So so go ahead, Alex. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Um, let me share my presentation real quick. Um, so we're going to talk about the Hayabusa two uh, project. It's it's a mission. It's an asteroid sample return mission. So it was set to venture to this asteroid and collect samples from it and return it to Earth. Um, it is this. It is a successor to the original Hayabusa mission, which was the first asteroid sample return mission, um, which returned samples back in 2010. Both of these missions uh, were pioneered by the Japanese Space Agency. Also worked with a lot of different agencies, including NASA. Um, but this is the second one. So as you can see, this is actually an image of the spacecraft. You can see those little blue dots. Those are the ion engines of the spacecraft. Uh, this is an artist rendition. Um, but the reason we want to talk about it is because just um, on the 5th, December 5th, actually we got the samples back from the Hayabusa 2 mission. Um, so that's our second sample. If you watched a about a month ago, you saw the OSIRIS-REx mission collected samples. That is another mission that's going to be returning asteroid samples. And so that'll be the third. Um, but so we'll get to talk a little bit about this, just kind of history about it, because it's been a few years in the making. Um, it originally launched in December 2014. Here you can see it launching off on its rocket. Um, the spacecraft itself just weighed in at about under a ton, about 1,300 pounds, so pretty heavy, um, but not gigantic. Um, and it actually took over about three years to reach its target, which has uh, two designations. It is either 162173 Ryugu, which is a little bit of a mouthful, or 1999 JU3. And so those are two names for the asteroid that we used to target. And so here you can actually see um, the path. So at our center, we have the sun, we have Mercury, Venus, we have Earth on this little green path, the blue ball. This white orbit is actually Itokawa. That is the first asteroid that was targeted by the Hayabusa mission, the original one. 
So that was the first sampled asteroid. And then 1999 JU3 is in the red path. That's the second sampled asteroid. So this is the actual one that Hayabusa 2 went to. And so you can see it actually comes pretty close to Earth orbit. So there's a couple little um, points where it crosses our orbit. And so, um, but yeah, as you can see, these are the two uh, asteroid orbits. So they're kind of in our inner orbits. They're not exactly in the asteroid belt, but they're um, like uh, 1993 JU3 is actually pretty close to Earth's orbit itself. And so here's an image from the spacecraft. The spacecraft has a lot of instruments. It has cameras. And here's a picture from one of those. So this is a camera on the spacecraft. That is the surface of the asteroid. So once it actually reached the asteroid, it surveyed it for about a year and a half. It took samples. It took pictures. And again, it took about three years to get here. So it took a while. And after that year and a half was up and it got its samples, it left in November of 2019 and started heading back to Earth. And that's when it actually dropped off our sample. So you actually get to see that. Alicia has a better presentation about the more current events of this mission. Um, but when we talk about it, we also have future targets. So we actually have, there's a, actually a lot of excess fuel on the spacecraft. And so now the Japanese Space Agency is considering other targets to visit. Um, we're going to send the spacecraft back out because the spacecraft didn't actually come down to Earth. It just sent a little pod with samples. You'll get to see that. But we're going to send this mission to other asteroids, and they're going to have it swing by Earth a couple times because we have the fuel to do so. So why waste it, you know? So now Alicia has a nice presentation about the sample collection. So you'll get to see that current event now. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, awesome. Yeah, so just following up on what Alex had mentioned. So uh, we are so lucky because earlier this month, we had a successful sample return. Um, and so there was about a 35 pound capsule, a, a little bit over a 35 pound capsule that was safely landed here on the earth. And we are really excited because on board or on that sample, or I'm sorry, on that um, capsule were two samples that are being analyzed. So the first was a gas sample that we did, uh, I believe December 7th or was done December 7th. And so what that sample was found uh, was that, or what that sample found um, is that it was originating not on the earth, which is really exciting because that means we do believe that the gas uh, was from the asteroid uh, Ryugu. So that's exciting to keep in mind. And so as you can see to the right, uh, there is an actual physical soil sample, a granular sample, if you will, um, that we are going to analyze. And I say we as an ASU also. So what happens now that we have the sample back on the earth? Well, ASU is really fortunate um, because Sparky staked a claim in this mission. And we here at ASU get to an help analyze this, uh, the sample that we have here. So we're one of the teams that gets a small portion of this and we get to share the science and results with you. And so what makes ASU qualified to do this? Well, uh, the previous director of the Center for Meteorite Studies and the current director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration, Dr. Minnie Wadwa, um, made a really great point that we here at ASU are able to uh, be very interdisciplinary and study many different things. And so in doing that, we have all of our astronomers together, we have our geologists together, um, and so we're gonna put them all in a room with chemists and, and physicists and see what they come up with. And so um, Dr. Wadwa uh, is very excited about this just as all of ASU is. And so ASU also has the Center for Meteorite Studies, which is the largest uh, collect, which houses the largest collection of meteorites held by any university. And so uh, we do a lot of uh, meteorite studying here in sample analysis. And so we're really excited to take a look at this sample um, from the asteroid Ryugu. So that wraps up our section. Rick, I'll hand things back to you. Thank you. So thank you guys very much. That was a great concise. That's exactly what we needed to see. I also uh, will tell the audience I did uh, uh, reach out to Manny. Uh, she's traveling. It was sort of very, very busy with a lot of uh, programs and things right now. <clears throat> and she couldn't be with us tonight. But I did uh, uh, just manage to confirm that really right now, just the timing of the thing is uh, the this, this sample is in Japan. 
uh, they will start working at it and uh, or on it and then share the data that they find with the science team, which includes members around the entire world. So the community is large. Um, they call this part of the science team and many is part of that. Uh, later, we're anticipating, we don't have the timing yet, but uh, but it could be half a year or so. Um, uh, we should actually be able to get some of that material here and uh, be able to kind of use some of our labs uh, to do some of the follow-up work and some of the deep, the digging deep deeper into the data and the analysis. So very super cool. We're kind of excited about this because I think about through two, three months ago, you and uh, at our program, we talked a lot about the OSIRIS-REx mission. And that was the one where, uh, which is run by the University of Arizona in Tucson very similar. So uh, the Japan Space Agency is doing the Hayabusa mission. Uh, uh, Tucson and the U.S. and the NASA JPL teams are doing the uh, OSIRIS-REx mission. Uh, there are science team members that cross and do all that kind of stuff. Science happens everywhere. And uh, so we're looking for a return of that sample that was collected, but not until about 2023. So it'll be a little bit before that one comes back to Earth. We're a little bit uh, going to have to wait. So this gives us uh, something to whet our appetite, something to examine before we get there and we'll see where that goes. Uh, I'm going to have to actually ask my group. I'll ask uh, uh, Alicia is uh, we're we taking another little pause here for question and answer or am I going right into uh, uh, the winter solstice part? You can go ahead into the winter solstice. Excellent. Here I go. So I'm going to share a different screen with you this time. And uh, um, hopefully this doesn't get too chunky because we got a lot to talk about. But um, uh, everybody should know the winter solstice is coming up and uh, the great conjunction is coming up. They happen to be at the same time or around the same uh, the same moments uh, on December the 23rd, uh, 21st. So that's next Monday. Uh, but that's completely a coincidence. There's nothing about the winter solstice that's says planets have to be in any place or not. And there's nothing about this planet conjunction that sort of says the solstice has to happen. These are just coincidentally happening at the same time. What you see on the screen is a, uh, this is a sort of, you, you can't really see this for a lot of reasons, but this is looking south uh, uh, from our latitude from the Phoenix area. And it's during the day, it's noontime. But what I've done is I've turned off the sky so we can see where the sun is and where how it's sort of like dancing amongst the uh, the constellations that are in the, in the sky uh, at noontime. But this is not an image you can see. I mean, also there's lines and names and all that stuff in the sky, but I wanna show you about some, some things that are going on here. So I'm gonna be adding some lines and we'll move a little bit back and forth a couple of days to show you sort of how movement works and uh, kind of give you. And, and then I've sort of made a little discovery also that'll be be kind of fun. So uh, on the screen here, uh, I'll use my pointer to sort of like point this out, but this is the sun. You know, I'm going to actually take the sun halo down a little bit so it's not so bright. There you go. So that's the position of the sun. Uh, right next to the sun, just right below it, is the planet Mercury. Uh, you won't be able to see it because it's too close to the sun, but it doesn't, it's very close to the sun anyway. It doesn't get very important. And then way off to the right over there, let me sort of see if I can, there it goes uh, off to the right over here. Uh, this is Venus. And then over on this side, uh, these are the stars of the conjunction show right there. That's uh, Jupiter, that's Saturn, and here's your little moon. And so I don't know how many of you, I hope everybody had a chance to go out before the program tonight, uh, just after sunset and uh, just sort of like before we got started. So you had about an hour or so to see the night sky. The moon was absolutely gorgeous. So it was a new moon a couple of days ago. Now it's a little crescent. It's one of those moons that gets a lot of earth reflection. So you can see the whole ball of the moon and then a very, very bright little crescent uh, uh, arm to it over there. And you can see it sort of just juxtaposed to where uh, Jupiter and Saturn are. If you didn't see that tonight, go back tomorrow and you're going to see some movement. Actually, I can do that. Let me just move forward one day and watch the moon really quick. You see where it is? There it goes. So tomorrow night, uh, the moon won't be just lower and to the right of those um, of the planets. It'll be uh, lower and to the left of the planets. 
and that's kind of the movement of the of the uh, of the moon night tonight. I'm going to go backwards a little bit now, and I'm going to add sort of one of those uh, little lines for you. This is actually sort of what we call the line of the ecliptic, and it's dated. So you can see that the sun is absolutely sort of like rock solid on this line, and you can see that we're sort of uh, the sun is in a position sometime in the middle of December. November is over towards Libra, and January is over in the other direction. And uh, uh, I just want to show you. What what happens. So you see uh, in uh, what the sun's movement does every day, it incrementally, our view of the sun moves just a little bit in the night sky. So there's, uh, this will be Friday, here's Saturday, here's Sunday, and here's um, Monday. Uh, notice that Mercury is changing position just a little bit. It's actually coming um, uh, uh, from around from behind the sun right now. Uh, still won't be able to see that, but this is it. So this is the position of the sun on the solstice. And that's meaningful in a couple of different ways. This is the time of year that the sun is the lowest above the horizon. You're going to have a poll question about this, so make sure you sort of pay attention. Uh, it is uh, when the angle of the sun is the lowest to the northern hemisphere, thus the reason we have winter this time of year. Uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is traditionally, I mean, it happens in this particular part of space, but 2,000 years ago when uh, the whole idea of uh, of uh, uh, zodiac constellations and everything was formed. Uh, this particular, the solstice time was when the sun was passing from the constellation Sagittarius. I show you over this way, from the constellation Sagittarius into Copernicus, Cap Capricornus, and uh, the reason that we name our uh, uh, tropic the Tropic of Capricorn is because, right, that's where the sun just graced that particular uh, line of latitude uh, in its travel uh, during its annual cycle, and that was the lowest position. With precession, the sort of the wobble of the earth, the sort of change of position of our axis in the earth to the night sky, which is a process that takes over 26,000 years, or almost 26,000 years to complete, uh, that particular, uh, the time of the solstice has actually moved back, if you want, retrograde a little bit, and so now it happens firmly in the constellation of Sagittarius, and that's where that is. I'm going to show you a couple of other things. I was playing with this today and I found some, some things that might be of interest. While we're talking about the solstice, I also wanted to show you a little bit about um, those planets. So I'm going to turn on uh, sort of the labels just so you see that there's, uh, there's Jupiter and Saturn right there. Let me turn off for a moment that ecliptic because it's just kind of in the way. Um, and then I'm also going to put the orbits of those planets on. And I want to show you this is actually kind of special. So you see those two little yellow lines now streaking across the sky. That is essentially the orbits of Saturn and Jupiter. Uh, you can see over on the right-hand side of the screen over in the constellation Libra, the lower one is the orbit of Jupiter, and the upper one is the orbit of Saturn. Uh, this is kind of important because, right, if they happen to be converging, you can see that over uh, in that position where Saturn, uh, where Saturn and Jupiter are right now, uh, those two orbits converge. In fact, I can see it's just right about here. This is why this particular conjunction Function is uh, greater or more spectacular or more important than conjunctions that happened before. The actual phenomenon happens about every 20 years, but you can imagine this would be a different story if those planets were at this location in their orbits or even further apart in their orbits. Uh, most of the time, this kind of goes unnoticed. The, the planets are in the same sky. They pass each other. They're not really, really sort of like right next to each other. So what happens at this one, this great conjunction, is that uh, Saturn and Jupiter happen to be in a position on their orbital uh, processes around the sun, where those orbits from our point of view are crossing. We call that a node. And so what's going to make it very, very special for us this year is that they're going to come very, very close to each other. And all of this is happening in this part of the sky. I am going to uh, just do something a little bit different. I wanted to sort of introduce an idea to you guys. And uh, it's kind of a it's kind of a wild thought game. The, the solstice is the time of year that the daylight is the shortest period. So sunrise to sunset uh, on the December the 21st, uh, that period is as 
as short as it gets during the year. Uh, the summer solstice is exactly the opposite. And so uh, uh, where we would have the longest daylight and the shortest night. But you might have noticed, and some people notice this, and some people ask me about this, uh, you might have noticed that uh, uh, the solstice uh, actually uh, is not the earliest, I'm sorry, the, not the latest sunset, earliest sunset, or nor is it the latest sunrise. The earliest sunset this time of year actually has already happened in the first part of December. And now the sun is setting just a little bit later each night. That's a little counterintuitive because if we're going to have the shortest day, you would think those things would match. Sun goes down at its earliest possible point. Sun rises at its latest possible point and gives us the longest uh, night, shortest day. Uh, it actually doesn't happen. And then the, um, uh, early, the latest sunrise, the time that the sun rises the latest in the morning, hasn't happened yet. That won't happen until about the 8th or 9th of January. And I just wanted to show you, I did a little slide thing here uh, just to kind of give you a little sense of why that's happening. It has to do um, with uh, the, uh, uh, hang on a second, let me just pay attention to this for just a second. I'm going to start share. <clears throat> I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. Um, uh, I'm going to just do a quick little sketch here. And the reason that that phenomenon happens is because the Earth's orbit is not ellip uh, circular, it's actually elliptical. So I'm just going to draw a kind of a really, really wild ellipse. Um, uh, Kepler discovered that planetary orbits are not a circle. Uh, they actually are a, an ellipse. And this is sort of, and then the center of the ellipse is actually uh, not the very, very middle, but we orbit around the sun and it is offside a little bit at one of the focuses. I've got this really, really exaggerated so you can uh, kind of sort of enjoy the show. Um, um, I'm just going to draw an earth over here in its part of the orbit and it's going to be going in this direction and I'm going to show you an earth over here in this part of the orbit, and it's going to be going this direction. So as we orbit around the sun and make that annual cycle, there's a period of its orbit where it's very, very close, or not a relatively close, closer than other. And then there is a period uh, where it is relatively far away. And Kepler figured out that all planets have some sort of elliptical orbit. Uh, the other thing that he figured out is that the Earth actually moves faster when it's closer to the sun. And so it actually moves faster through space and it moves slower when it's further from the sun. It moves slower through space. And so what that means is that the relationship we call a, a day cycle, a solar uh, noon, if you want, a uh, 24-hour day. The idea is that where are we? We're Tempe, Arizona, or Phoenix, Arizona. If we go around once in a 24-hour day, we're just sort of like right under the sun again. Um, actually, that's not so true. It averages a 24-hour day through the entire year. But, however, uh, it actually slows down a little bit at part of the year and gets behind. It speeds up at part of the year and catches up and then gets ahead. And so that particular motion, the fact that we are in the wintertime, uh, that we are close, uh, and that we are going faster, actually sort of changes that relationship between where the sun is at its transit at that noon hour. And then that changes the calculation of sunrise and sunset uh, before the transit and after the transit. And so that's really the reason for that. If we had a circular orbit, uh, the sun would uh, basically not do that. It would be the same all the time. You might have seen this before. This is called an analemma, and this is actually the analysis of what the sun is doing. On the left-hand side of the screen is a photographic image, and this was taken from a, a place of the sun at a very specific time. I can tell this is about noon because it's uh, the analemma is straight up and down. And it looks to me like this. these images were taken about a week apart, not moving the camera, basically same place, take a picture, same time of day, wait one week, do it again, wait one week, do it again. And so you can see the movement of the sun through its annual cycle. When it's the highest in the sky, that's going to be the summer solstice, the summer standstill. When it's lowest, that's going to be the winter solstice or the winter standstill. 
The graph on the other side just basically puts the numbers to this. And you can see there's an axis that goes top to bottom right down through the middle here. That would be the equivalent of your noon. That's the transit of the sun. And this calculates for you uh, how far the sun is off of that noon cycle. Sometimes it is retarded up to about uh, uh, 16 and a half minutes, and sometimes it's advanced about 14 minutes. And you can see down at the bottom of that particular screen, eh, maybe I can draw this, that the time of the period of time that we're talking about is right here. We've gone from late November until the first part of January. Uh, the uh, the latest sunsets already happened over here and the latest uh, or the earliest sunrises um, happen over here. I get those backwards. So the earliest sunset, the latest sunrise uh, are kind of separated from uh, uh, the winter solstice just by this the nature of this particular movement. And so I know that's really, really complicated. And the things to remember is, uh, is that the sun actually, uh, or the earth uh, moves slower at part of its orbit, faster at part of its orbit. And that means it's a rotation, it's a period of rotation that defines a day gets a little bit off. This is also sometimes called sun fast. If you have a uh, sundial or something like that, this is a calculation that minutes you would have to add or subtract from your sundial to actually have an accurate calculation of time. So that's where that comes from. Wanted to show you one more thing and then we'll get off of the solstice thing. This is an image from that I took uh, uh, It's several years ago now. It's at Chimney Rock in Southern uh, uh, Colorado. You probably, maybe some of you have been here. Uh, and uh, what you see here is Chimney Rock is kind of over to the left. There's a line of mountains. We're looking directly east and that silver apparatus that's in the screen is um, uh, uh, essentially a little thing I built. I mount a camera to it and it gives me a specific horizon and there's actually sort of tick marks on there where I can talk about degrees. I can take an image like this and then drop it into our planetarium at ASU and then I can replicate what the sky is going to be doing at any given time. Uh, this particular uh, uh, one shows you that uh, the sun is rising over there. Again, we're looking east. <clears throat> that is to the north. And that's where the sun would be at the summer solstice. Uh, next image, I stack the two of them together. So the one you just looked at is on the bottom of the screen. The winter solstice is at the top of the screen. And you can see the amount of travel. So this is, uh, this is essentially our latitude. It's a little higher uh, than us, but that, that amount of travel that the sun uh, condition has at the horizon is really, really important. And it's been very important culturally, not only in Native American communities, but elsewhere to sort of understand the movement of the sun, the changing of the seasons, because it is very correlated to the movement of the sun across the horizon. A solstice means standstill, which means that when it reaches its summer position, which is going to be way over towards the left part of the screen here, uh, it gets there and then it just kind of stops for a while. For several days, it'll be rising in that same location day after day after day. And then slowly it'll start moving to the south. It picks up speed as it passes the car east and then when it gets down to the southern part uh, its southernmost rise it does the same thing it appears to stand still for several days it'll just sort of like rise just a little bit over those mountains in the same location and then once we see that it triggers the movement back to the north again the solstice has always been important culturally, and it's always seen as a positive time. It seems kind of weird that sort of we're celebrating the winter, we're celebrating the longest night, we're celebrating the cold and the darkness, but this is the moment where the sun uh, sort of reassures us, where it stops for a moment, and then in the coming weeks after the solstice on the 21st, we'll start to see the sun sort of making its way back up towards the north, promising a new spring, promising new crops, new flowers, uh, new growth period, all of that kind of stuff, and it will return. And so that's how people have seen this. And this is how people have used uh, horizons like this to calculate that movement, understand what's going on, knowing the depth of winter uh, is, uh, is, is here, but when it's complete, the promise of the sun coming back north will happen. And that's really how people have, have done this. So uh, that's uh, kind of our little talk on the solstice. 
watch those sunrises and sunsets. That's uh, really complicated to sort of see. You can check that out in the paper if you want to, uh, to sort of see how that works. I think uh, uh, if you're a morning person and you like to get up when the sun's up, um, you're in trouble uh, for the next couple of weeks. And then after about June, uh, January the 6th, uh, the sun will start rising a little bit earlier in the mornings and we'll get up a little earlier. And so, so uh, summer solstice. I'm going to stop this for a little bit. I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to stop sharing this particular screen screen. And uh, um, I'm going to go back to my team just for a real quick question or two. And then I'm just going to show you something about getting ready uh, for the uh, great conjunction. So let's do that next. Okay, thank you, Rick. Um, we're going to go ahead and launch the third poll. Um, what does the winter solstice signify? Shortest daylight hours, beginning of winter, the sun's lowest transit, and all of the above. So go ahead and cast your polls. And all of the above, most of you seem to be right. Sort of right on. Mm -hmm. That's because we're good presenters. That's right. Okay, we can wait a little bit longer, just in case. Okay. I'm gonna, yep, there they are. We can share the results now. Um, and most of you are right, all of the above. Um, so all of you are paying attention and that's so good to know. We can maybe launch the next poll. Alicia, do you want to go ahead with it? Actually, the next um, poll actually, might be for the end. Oh. Ex yep. Oh. All right. <laughs> so, Rick, Sorry about that. You're fine. Rick, if you want to go ahead and um, move on to the next section, and then we can take the last poll if there's time. Okay, sounds good. I'm going to, I'm just kind of setting up a little screen here. Let me get out and do that. Um, and then I'm going to go back to the planetarium program and share that with everybody. Uh, if you've been watching our programs over the last couple of, uh, of weeks, we've been kind of sharing with you a view of the solar system. And um, so I'm going to set that up over on my screen, it'll be a simulation of what the solar system looks like and the locations of all the planets, where they are right now. But before I show you that, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Alex uh, to just play a quick little video. I've got a little, and he'll he'll call it up and then I'll set it up. What I did is I made a little simulation and it's about the movement of uh, uh, Saturn and Jupiter over the last four months. So you see sort of here's what we're doing. We've got Saturn and Jupiter. This is right after sunset. This particular view you is from August the 15th. And you can see we're facing south. You can see the, the juxtaposition between Saturn and Jupiter. You can see where they are in the sky and how far apart they are. And um, just a moment, I'm going to ask Alex to just play this. It takes about uh, just 17, 20 seconds. Uh, and just, I just want you, it's going to move right up until December the 21st. So I want you to watch if you've been paying attention to the night sky and you've been kind of watching this movement um, over the last several weeks. Uh, go ahead and play it, Alex. And we'll, let me sh let's show people what, what we've got here. So we're moving through several, several um, weeks at a time here, days. You can see Saturn and Jupiter getting closer and closer. And that's December the 21st. That's when they're going to uh, uh, just be in conjunction. In fact, look, their little labels have like uh, all just sort of like mushed together there. Um, uh, thank you very much. Would you just play it one more time just so we can watch that again? And then I'll be set up over here and we'll take a look at what's going on over here. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the, the orbits of the planets for the same period of time and what's been happening out there in space. While uh, we're finishing this, as you're watching them come together again and crash into each other, I'm going to say again, uh, we are planning an activity for uh, next Monday night, and it comes with a lot of caveats. First of all, it's uh, not the same time you're used to. We're going to actually do this at... Um, um, uh, at uh, 5.30 is when we're starting. It'll still be a little light out. The sun will set someplace after that. But I know about 5.30, we can actually sort of locate visually, we can locate Saturn and Jupiter and we can see what's going on. Um, I'm going to, um, uh, then we're going to uh, invite, we've already invited and we have some good response from several of our, uh, our friends, uh, astronomy friends, amateur astronomers from around the community. And what we're gonna attempt to do is something that has never happened in the history of the world. Uh, 
we're going to kind of have cameras, we're going to have telescopes, and we're going to try to do a, a just sort of a live viewing of, of the phenomenon. And we're going to like look through our telescopes and see what we can see. We've already done some test stuff. We already realize we have some problems. Um, it turns out that, um, let me just going to like move my machine in here a little bit so you can see a little bit better what we've got going. Um, we, um, um, uh, we know that Saturn is actually much dimmer than Jupiter. You can actually see it if you like look out there. And in a telescope view, that's going to be really strange because the cameras are very, very sensitive. So they're going to pick up a very bright Jupiter and a very dim Saturn. And trying to reconcile those two things is going to be a problem. So we know that's going to happen. We don't know if it's going to be cloudy or dark or whatever, but uh, but we won't care too much about that because we'll just get together anyway. And uh, if we have something to show, we will. And if we don't, we don't. But uh, many of you have already been invited. Many of you have already registered. This is going to be another webinar and uh, um, it'll be sort of uh, 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 just, you can just drop in. Uh, we'll see what's going on. It's only going to last for about an hour, about 530 by about 630. Both of those objects will sort of like set behind the trees for most of our locations. And uh, so we won't be able to see it, but um, this is unusual. Uh, I said the conjunction happens about every 20 years, but this particular view uh, hasn't been around for a long time, since about the 1200s. Uh, there was another very close conjunction like this in the 1600s, but it was right behind the sun, and it was almost impossible to see. And it hasn't happened like this since. And uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's now, right, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, people like us have telescopes, and we have the technology where we can actually look at this, actually have this particular view. Very unusual. So we're going to take advantage of it. We're going to try to do this. I want to uh, make sure that uh, um, that everybody sort of uh, gets linked in, uh, follow it. You've been seeing it on the news already, and uh, we'll see where we go. Okay, uh, real quickly, I know we're running a little bit behind. Sorry about that, but I want to do this. So when uh, we set up that last view, the one you saw in the video that Alex just played, I shall show you. So this is where um, uh, the Earth, <clears throat> I'm going to flip it around this way because I like this view just a little bit better. Uh, this is where the Earth, uh, Jupiter, and Saturn were. So you can see just a little bit here. Let me get a little bit closer. Um, you can see the orbit of the Earth. Let me make the Earth bigger uh, so you can see what it looks like. There you go. And you can see that we're not really aligned. The Earth, Jupiter, and I have these blown up really, really huge. So they don't really overlap like that in space. But you, what you're looking for here is the alignment. And so you can see last August, uh, we could definitely see the two planets. They were definitely next to each other in space. Uh, but from our point of view, there was lots of distance between them. Let me just move out a little bit and I'm just gonna move you forward um, and, uh, and show you what's going on here. So I'm gonna move forward one month in two seconds and you'll sort of start to see what's going on. So now uh, the planets have moved a little bit further. I'm gonna make this actually easier to see by putting the sun in the center instead of the earth. <clears throat> I'm going to move forward one more month in two seconds, and you'll see sort of the movement of those planets. You see the Earth is actually moving uh, quite a little bit in its orbit. I mean, it only takes 12 months to go all the way around, so month by month it moves a lot further. And Jupiter and Saturn are moving almost not at all. Jupiter a little bit further than Saturn, so now we're up to November the 15th. Um, I'm just going to kind of finish it out here. I'm going to go up to... Uh, um, uh, December, let me get the view in here. Let's get a little bit tighter. Uh, I'm going to make the earth just a little bit bigger because this is, you can't see it quite. And uh, um, I'm just going to kind of move forward now five seconds to get us up until the winter solstice day. I'm just going to like watch really closely, see how the earth is now moving sort of around behind. And as the earth is coming down towards the bottom of the screen, Jupiter and Saturn are positioning themselves just a little bit higher in the screen. And this is really uh, what's happening is we will get this pretty, just perfect alignment um, or near perfect alignment between the earth 
Saturn and Jupiter. Uh, the planets are just doing their thing. They're just doing their orbits. They're doing it like normal. But this particular uh, juxtaposition of having them all lined up with like this. And as I showed you before, the orbits actually in sync from our point of view so that we're seeing them in the same plane. Uh, that's what we're looking for. And that's what's going to be special about five days from now. That's why we're calling this the grand, the great conjunction. And uh, we hope you're watching it on media. We hope you're following this. We hope you understand the significance of sort of that these kinds of things happen and they don't happen very often. And please tell your friends, uh, get LinkedIn, come join us on Monday night at 5.30 and uh, we'll see you then. I'm going to uh, kind of stop share. I'm done with uh, with my machines and showing you what we have. If uh, the team has anything to wrap up, uh, another poll or two and some questions. I know we're going a little long, but I think it'd probably be all right tonight. Thanks. Awesome. I'll go ahead and launch our last poll of the evening. So it says, are you attending our great conjunction event? So Rick just gave you guys a whole bunch of wonderful details and information about this event. So we'd love to see you there, obviously. And if you're able to just go ahead and answer that poll question. Oh, it looks like uh, I think we got some people that are sort of like going to do this. Look at that. Awesome. I'll go ahead and end it really quick. Most of us voted and I'll show the results. And it looks like 92% of us will be there. So we will see you at our great conjunction event. Good. And the That's link awesome. is the link is in the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah, everybody can see the link for you guys. And so, uh, uh, and it'll, it'll be very, very similar to this. You'll come on as participants, you'll be able to watch and we'll have uh, uh, the astronomers, they're going to present that night and sort of show us what they've got. Uh, they'll all sort of like come on one at a time and say, here's my rig and here's my telescope. And here's what I'm seeing from my particular site. We'll, we'll see. Hopefully it won't be cloudy and hopefully we'll have some sort of good views. It'll be kind of cool to watch. So cool to participate in. Uh, anything else, guys, from my team? Any Anybody want to share anything else as we go forward? Let me just, re let me, I see uh, Nancy is still here. So Dr. Mary Boy, thank you so much for being part of our presentation. I, uh, I can't wait to work with you again uh, uh, after the holidays and into the, into the spring. We will be suspending our virtual night skies just for a brief time. So we'll be back on January the 11th uh, will be our next one. That's a Wednesday night. Uh, and then from then we have actually programmed them every other Wednesday until June. So we'll see, we'll see how the COVID works out. We'll see when we can get people back on site to our uh, to ASU, but um, I think um, I think this is working for us, and we've got lots to talk about. We have some anniversaries coming up. Uh, the Apollo missions uh, all happened within about three years, and that was about 50 years ago. So just about every couple months, there's a new anniversary, and so we'll be celebrating the 14th anniversary of the uh, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, 14th Apollo mission, Apollo 14. We'll be celebrating that um, in January time period and early February. And so that's to look forward to. Um, we, have, of course, have uh, our own Native American Skies program coming up and then watch for Nancy's lecture series and watch for uh, the one especially on the 29th. I'll share with you when that happens. It's not an ASU event, but I think that would be worth sharing and, and worth everybody looking at. So, um, so watch for us. Uh, thank you very much. Have a really happy holiday. I don't know if anybody noticed my water mug here, sort of I'm trying to... Uh, trying to be, do the right thing and get my gingerbread guy out of the cupboard. And so, uh, so I'm sorry, the virtual night sky, I just noticed here, I said it wrong. It's not January 11th, it's January the 13th. And so that's, it's the Wednesday. That's the thing to remember. And so our next program will be um, the great conjunction uh, next Monday night at 530. And then our next virtual night sky will be January the 13th uh, back at the seven o'clock time slot. Thank you guys very, very much. Thank you to my team for, uh, for supporting this and putting it together. Sorry, we're running about uh, seven, eight minutes late, but lots to get through tonight. And I hope that was enjoyable. We will see everybody um, um, next year. Have a good holiday. Thank you. Bye-bye.